In 1928, Congress authorized the construction of the Hoover Dam, then known as the Boulder Dam. This structure was to be located in the Black Canyon area in Nevada and Arizona, which is ultimately where the modern dam sits. Construction began in 1931 and was completed in 1936. At the climax of the project, it employed 5,251 workers in an environment that would regularly reach 120 degrees Fahrenheit. The Hoover Dam is the largest concrete framework dam in America and is a massive tourist attraction for people across the globe. It supplies water to farms in the surrounding desert region, waters to cities like Los Angeles and Las Vegas, and it generates electricity for nearly 8 million people in the U.S. states of Arizona, California, and Nevada. While certainly not the largest dam in the world, this impressive feat of engineering changed the course of American history. Well, good morning. Um, my name is Bob Lynn, and welcome to the National Infrastructure Bank Moonshot, hiring and training a workforce for the 21st century jobs. Uh, <clears throat> as you just saw there, Hoover Dam, that's a big piece of infrastructure that uh, is known throughout the United States and throughout the world. Infrastructure in the United States <clears throat> used to be uh, famous in all the feats that we were able to accomplish. Uh, what we need to be able to do now is invest in America again so that we start to take the leadership role that we, des we deserve and, and, and we really need. Uh, one of the things that uh, we're gonna talk about today is if this National Infrastructure Bank, once it becomes law, how do we go about hiring and training the workforce to be able to actually do all the work that needs to get done? And so we've, we've assembled a, a group of experts and uh, legislator, legislators who are working on trying to make sure that the building blocks for the training uh, of these workers and the ability to be able to get these workers uh, to the jobs uh, and, and actually start to do that is part of the whole grand scheme. Uh, it's kind of uh, both things have to happen almost simultaneously. And, and so it's important to think about that as, as we go through today's uh, conversation. Uh, we're gonna have a lot of uh, uh, of people talking about what they're working on and, and how to be able to get that done. Um, we have representatives from Ohio, Pennsylvania, and, and uh, Mass or uh, Virginia, and uh, we are looking at trying to make sure that uh, people really get a feel for where we are on this. So uh, I'm not going to take up much more time. I'm just going to kind of make sure the conversation flows here, and we're going to start off with uh, my good friend, Representative Lisa Sebecki from Ohio. Lisa. Thank you, Bob. Um, as Bob said, I'm State Representative Lisa Sebecki. I represent the 45th House District in the state of Ohio. And if you're not familiar uh, with that area, I am from the Toledo, Ohio area. And before I became a state legislator, I um, served on the Toledo Board of Education here locally for eight years and was intimately involved with building new buildings in our infrastructure in our city here. And this is um, really the appropriate time for us to talk about um, the National Infrastructure Bank and what, what we need to do to prepare for um, these jobs and having this ability to um, get our, um, our workforce prepared for when infrastructure comes. And we can think about you know, the current um, apprenticeship programs that are taking place in our respective states. But I also think um, that we also, or we also think that we also have to think about who's gonna be backfilling those jobs in the near future. And this is why I think it's critically important that we also talk about if you think about that kindergartner that's entering school now, they're gonna be graduated in 2033. And I know that sounds like a long ways away, but it actually isn't. It'll be here before we know it. And having those opportunities to um, speak with our youngest um, citizens now about those future jobs, because we can build infrastructure, but we need to maintain our infrastructure because we're all aware that uh, we have an infrastructure across our United States that we've just been putting little band-aids and tourniquets on, as I always say, but to really have that um, ability to be able to train our youngest 
um, kids that say starting, like I said before, starting in kindergarten now um, to get them prepared and let them know that an apprenticeship program is a good paid job and take it down those um, stigmas that's been out there for a while. Um, but so going into a career readiness or a career tech program in your school will be able to prepare you for that future to, so we can maintain our infrastructure and having a job within the apprenticeship programs um, to be able to do that will give you a good living wage, a good retirement. And as I always say here in the state of Ohio, an opportunity for you to be able to live, work and dream and retire right here. Uh, if you're working on infrastructure in the state of Ohio, we passed, uh, oh, excuse me, we introduced a piece of legislation in the state house. And um, by analysis of that, if we were able to have the National Infrastructure Bank, is it would put um, 800,000 people to work right here in the great state of Ohio. So why not have uh, folks that live, work, and um, live and work here be able to retire in our state by being able to be a part of um, not only building the infrastructure, but also being able to maintain that infrastructure. So I'm not going to take any more of your time on because I really want to hear all these great questions that everyone's going to have. And so I'll turn it back to our moderator, um, Mr. Bob Lynn. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Um, uh, thanks for that. Also, uh, since uh, Lisa brought it up, uh, we do have the Q&A section. So if you have a question and, and would like an answer, please uh, uh, fill in a question and we will do our best to make sure you get an answer to that question. Uh, next, I'm going to ask uh, Representative Joe Cerisi from Pennsylvania, if, if you wouldn't mind sharing us some of the things that are going on in Pennsylvania and, and where we uh, need to move forward from there. Well, thank you so much. And uh, it's a great honor to be on this call. And I want to thank my colleague from the West, from the great state of Ohio. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to have met her and become friends with her on this issue and work with her on this. As you can see on the screen right now is House Resolution 636 which has been reintroduced for this session. I don't think the House number is the same. Um, well, maybe it is the same, I apologize. Uh, but the, the whole premise of this got started when we started looking at how do we, how do we really put people back to work? And, and the idea of the bank is a wonderful idea, but if we don't have the workforce, if we don't have the people who can handle it, we can put all the money in the world in that bank, it's not gonna mean anything. And Lisa and I, I representative from Ohio, I think we have similar backgrounds. We both were school board members. Um, I was a president of a board, a president of a vocational technical school, and we saw that these kids were coming out of the school with high paying jobs right into workforce with the ability to go off to university still if they chose to, but had a very high paying job. But we weren't seeing enough of them be coming out of this institution. Every one of us who's ever called on anyone in, in the trades has heard how long it's going to take and what it costs to get someone out. I, I just recently we were doing a project at our house and the person said, sure, I can be out in May of 2022. And I went, 2022, there is a, a lack of, of people, of students. So the one thing I was thinking as, as Lisa was speaking is what can all of you on this call do for us? What's important to everyone on this call is to work with your local school districts to make sure that our career and technical schools are well supported that we're supporting these programs at a young age, that we give them the staff that they need, that they're working with their unions and their areas and their other trades to talk about what's needed, where we need to go, to get involved in these institutions, to make sure that um, we have this workforce development. And in Pennsylvania, we're starting to see the trades schools starting to grow more and more. Um, and the universities are looking to see about the possibility of picking up and adding these to their uh, educational resources also that you have both the trade education and the business background so when you open that business you know where you're going how you're going how to run it which is extremely important but the president right now is speaking about the huge infrastructure um, project that he wants to put forth in America one of the biggest we've seen in a very long time but if we don't have the people who can work it's not going to help um, push this forward so I am looking forward to the questions that are here today. In our state, Pennsylvania was known as one of the top states for the trades for years. Of course, we're a steel state, as everyone knows, it's all changed. 
Um, but we want to push to get back into that infrastructure, to train our students, to have great high paying jobs, uh, sustainable future so they can support our state. And if they do move on to other states like Ohio, they can support their state too. So we'll take some of the Ohioans to Pennsylvania. Um, but it's very important to us to be able to push this educationally. And for all of you on this call, where it may not be thousands of people, we have the power to get out the message to support the trade, support students uh, being trained in this. And uh, like the representative said prior to me, you know, it does start in kindergarten. We all played in the sandbox with the, the little truck and, and building things. And uh, we were all amazed by that as children. We need to keep that going uh, throughout and take away the stigma of children who do attend the career and technical schools. And I think we've started to see more of that happen, but we need to continue down that path. So thank you. Look forward to answering questions. I'll pass it back over to Robert. Uh, thanks, Joe. Uh, one of the things that uh, I, I think we need to continue to focus on in order to do it, uh, I was a union organizer for 25 years, and, and I often went into schools to talk to uh, uh, students uh, about what they wanted to do basically for the next 35, 36 years of their life, 40 years of their life to be able to do that when they graduate. And, and uh, oftentimes they, they have the, the illusion that they're going to go and become the next video uh, creator and, and make millions of dollars to be able to do that. And, and it was uh, kind of interesting to listen to them talk. But the most interesting thing was when we go and uh, we wind up going to uh, open houses and the, the the number one person that uh, we started to focus on to be able to, to give them permission, their children permission to be able to get into the trades and to be able to get into an apprenticeship program is the mother. You really have to be able to connect with moms to be able to allow them to be able to give permission to their sons and to their daughters to be able to get into the trades, to be able to get into that apprenticeship program. So I would encourage you that whenever you get a chance and you're, you're talking to somebody about the trades or you're talking about apprenticeship things, is to focus to make sure that the moms are comfortable with it to be able to understand it. Now, a lot of times they want their kids to grow up and be doctors and lawyers and all that. All great stuff. We need doctors, we need lawyers, but we also need people to be able to do that. And, and being a tradesperson is not a dumb occupation. Uh, oftentimes I go to and talk to uh, uh, school counselors and they wanted to give me the person who's flunking out of school, doesn't show up, et cetera. That's not the type of person who builds these types of high-tech projects like you saw with Hoover Dam to be able to do that. That takes technical skill to be able to do what's important to be able to do that. So I'd encourage you to, to make sure you reach out uh, whenever you get that opportunity and talk to the parents, talk to the moms. And, and that once that permission starts to get uh, going, I, I think there's really an opportunity there to, to start to take that stigma away from people who work with their hands. Um, with that, what we're going to do right now is not, we're going to switch gears just a little bit. We're going to go to Alfeca Mutardi, and she's going to explain just a little bit about the needs for the, for the bank and then uh, also talk about how many jobs uh, it potentially has to create. So Alfeca, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you very much and uh, good morning to everyone on the call. Uh, my name is Alfeca Mutardi. I'm a macroeconomist. I used to work at the International Monetary Fund and now I'm currently the economic advisor for the Coalition for National Infrastructure Bank. And um, I've been intimately involved with uh, the um, the, uh, the, the effort that's now going on to reintroduce into Congress uh, another version of the bill, HR 6422, which actually creates a bank, a four to $5 trillion bank to lend for infrastructure. So um, what we've done on this iteration of the bank and also in preparation for this discussion of training is to go from how much will we spend to what is the composition of the workers that we need to do the construction jobs to how do we provide training for them? So uh, going to the first um, question, uh, what we've done is to, could, I, could you pull up my first slide there um, on the size of the bank? So we've sized this bank at $5 trillion. And where did we get this figure from? Uh, we actually got it from the American Society of Civil Engineers who say that altogether we need $6.1 trillion over a 10 year period to uh, fix all of our nation's infrastructure. And that, that's a lot larger than uh, of course, the current plan in the Biden administration uh, called the American Jobs Plan at two and a quarter trillion 
of which about a trillion is for infrastructure solely on for infrastructure projects. We will need absolutely for this Biden plan to pass if we're going to have another uh, enough money to uh, solve all of this $6.1 trillion problem right here. Uh, so this is part of the funded part that's uh, within the, the engineers have said are, are within the, the, the funding uh, scope. But we want this bank to cover the remaining gap, what's left over after the federal government puts in its part and state and local governments put in their part. This bank will pick up the $2.6 trillion for the rest of it. In addition to that, we want the we will widen the scope of the definition, and uh, we want to cover um, more affordable housing, high speed rail, and also a broadband rollout here. So we want to be able to, in terms of composition of workers, we want to be building much more transportation projects, roads, bridges, uh, highways, um, um, tr mass transit. Um, passenger rail, and we want to cover much more water projects too. Uh, that will include uh, tearing up the streets to put in new water pipes, replacing all the lead line pipes, and fixing sewer overflows and those kinds of things. So those are the kinds of construction jobs that we'll be having coming up into the future. Uh, could you go to the next slide, please? So uh, there was a very interesting study that came out by Georgetown University uh, Center for Education and the Workforce just uh, a few weeks ago. And what they did was to look into the analysis of what kind of workers would we need to do the construction jobs that are called for under Biden's plan. And what they concluded was that we'll need 15 million workers over a 10 year period, and that these workers will fl flip in and out of the workforce uh, to do the construction jobs, and that will be provide a temporary re relief to the blue collar economy. Now, uh, how does uh, how, uh, the, the breakout for the kinds of jobs that they were suggesting would be needed uh, would be um, we would require qualifications of at least a high school diploma for most of the jobs, um, some uh, college degrees, some post-secondary education and certification, and then the rest would be uh, bachelor's and master's and advanced degrees beyond that. But for the most part, all of these, 75% of all these workers that will need for these jobs will be a two-year college degree or less with certification. So those are the, the areas that we're, uh, we're going to be able to fill jobs with. Now, suppose that we add on another $5 trillion in spending financed by the National Infrastructure Bank, what will that do? That will create an additional 25 million direct and indirect jobs, again, in the transportation and construction industries, uh, services, including back office uh, services and manufacturing inputs into the construction. So um, those are the kinds of things, the extra jobs that we'll be, need to have a new up and running uh, program to uh, provide uh, education for. Uh, so again, as um, previous speaker said, this will be through the, the school systems with the backing of um, you know, uh, attracting uh, young young people into these new admin, new uh, occupations, um, and uh, that will that will cover uh, seventy five percent of this workforce. Then we're going to need to to make it into a two, sort of a two part thing, which I understand. Uh, some of the speakers will talk about this. Uh, you really need to have the theory behind it, uh, your this new construction job, and that means the basics like uh, the maths algebra, trigonometry, you need those kind of uh, inputs and education, for example, to do uh, to get an elect uh, a certification in um, building electricity, for example, you have to do be able to do a load calculation on your electric equipment that you're installing. Um, so we'll, uh, the training uh, will emphasize theory and practical experiences, the length of the training will go from anywhere from a month to two years. Um, if you'll, you'll, uh, we'll, we'll be talking about telephony in a minute, in a minute, uh, those kinds of telephony to install broadband and those kind of things are actually, uh, taught by the, um, uh, installation companies themselves, the private companies themselves, but we will need these apprentice programs that are offered by the union. We'll really be relying a lot on these apprentice programs to train new workers. So that's the composition of the workforce, the size of the workforce that we'll need. 
And we we're, we now look forward to hearing uh, the particulars of how we can train uh, these um, these new workers through these apprenticeship programs. Thanks. Thanks, Alfeca. Uh, next, I'm going to ask uh, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Lou Spencer. He he uh, uh, is a senior apprentice training expert from uh, Camp Springs, Maryland, to kind of give us an idea of uh, what's been going on in, in uh, the trades as far as uh, training, et cetera. So the floor is yours, Lou. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. My name is Lou Spencer, and I'm an American labor leader, a former construction executive, and I'm a master plumber gas fitter. And yes, at one time I was an apprentice. Today, I want to speak with you as a former training director and certified instructor uh, of an apprenticeship program and how apprenticeship programs dovetail with the National Infrastructure Bank. Um, upon successful passage of legislation for a National Infrastructure Bank, we must be prepared for the opportunity of integrating tens of millions of new employees into high paying jobs. A new National Infrastructure Bank will create 25 a million new jobs and launch a national training program effort we've not seen since the Great Depression and the World War II economic mobilization. The National Infrastructure Bank will pay Davis-Bacon wages and collaborate with trade unions and other institutions to create a skilled workforce on par with any other nation. That workforce will be able to immediately handle entry-level positions in construction and renovation on all sorts of infrastructure projects such as highways, bridges, rail, transmission lines, broadband, water treatment, and power plants. Apprenticeship training programs are the best way to connect career seekers, employers, and education partners, so they collaborate and seize on the opportunity of assimilating tens of millions of new employees into high paying jobs on infrastructure projects. There are approximately 25,000 registered apprenticeship programs active across the nation. There are approximately 1,000 registered apprenticeship training programs active across the nation that are privately funded. And um, they're funded through collective bargaining. Uh, employer contributions uh, total over 1 billion per year. And these apprenticeship training programs offer adult men and women the chance to work and further their education without the burden of student loans. In addition, programs such as Helmets to Hard Hats and Veterans in Piping offer our servicemen and women opportunities to transition from military service into the building trades and the pipe trade apprenticeships. This is worth repeating. The training is funded through employer contributions, ratified first by the union members themselves with an eye towards advancing the craft to prepare and train future generations of tradespersons on how to be their very best, to use emerging technologies to accomplish the work in the most productive and efficient manner possible. Apprenticeship trains the future workforce how to do the work, do it well, and this brings projects in under budget in one time. Apprenticeships ensure the continuation of other labor management jointly run trust funds, such as medical plans and retirement savings plans. These plans exist for the benefit of the participants, the apprentices and journey persons who work and contribute to them. The apprenticeship program that I'm most familiar with is recognized throughout the United States. Once apprentices graduate from the program as seasoned tradespeople, they work locally for signatory employer, employers or if so inclined in other areas of the country when employment opportunities are present. Apprentices receive one the job training while they, while they earn while they learn. And they receive related training classes and obtain required licenses and certifications. Apprentices work on private, residential, and commercial projects. They work on public government and institutional projects. They work on heavy highway projects, and they work on water and wastewater treatment projects. They learn all types of building and piping systems. They become certified in certain aspects of their craft, including welding, OSHA safety certifications. They obtain journey worker licenses, and they learn CPR and first aid. In some cases, they earn college credit. Apprentices assist, assist experienced journey persons in the installation and servicing of building systems. The apprentices are paid for this employment. Their hands-on training, along with the related training in the classroom and shop, provide apprentices with all the experience and knowledge they need for a lifelong career in the trade. 
Moreover, most training programs have con a continuing education component or journey person training. As previously stated, these journey persons are the employees who have agreed through collective bargaining to set aside some money in the form of employer contributions to advance their craft so they too are prepared and trained to continue to be the very best in their field, accomplish the work and bring their employer's project in one time and achieve satisfactory margins for their employers. So to summarize, the National Infrastructure Bank will effectively cost the taxpayers very little. There will be no new taxes, there will be no new deficit created and no new federal debt. The bank expects its loans will be repaid profits from the bank's lending will cover the operating expenses of the bank. And to ensure a well-trained workforce is readily available to perform the infrastructure work and perform it well, self-funded apprentice and journeyman training programs are in existence right now, capable of training a workforce for careers in the 21st century. Therefore, we're asking every citizen to write or call your congressman and ask for him or her to support HR 6422 the National Infrastructure Bank, to create great paying jobs in your area. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Lou, for that. Um, next, I'm going to ask uh, Representative Derisha, uh, Derisha Parker from Pennsylvania, if you wouldn't mind sharing with us uh, some of the things that are going on in, in your region of uh, Pennsylvania. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, one of the things, and thank you for having me today, you all know, you, I used to get nervous, I can say last year, uh, when um, I was coming before the, the union, because I didn't know what to say or how to be educated about what happened. Now that I've come into this role, I feel more comfortable having conversations because we're all in this together to jointly talk about what we can do to build a better world and actually a better um, Commonwealth, especially for Philadelphia, for all individuals. So thank you. Thanks for that. Uh, I uh, it. Yep, you, you've done terrific. Uh, keep on. The uh, best thing we can do, and, and uh, you you say, say it very succinctly. It's about being able to just express your views to be able to do that and say it with that confidence. It's important that uh, we share with each other to be able to, to make sure that things that we believe in are important and we need to be able to have that kind of communication. The one thing that we've probably lacked most lately is actually having, having discussions. We've gotten into screaming matches and we've gotten into a lot of uh, this versus that. And what we have to, at the end of the day, realize that we're all Americans. And at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is do what's great for this country. And by doing what's great for this country, I believe that will in turn help us to be able to uh, affect the world and be able to continue to, to make and, and be that shining star that uh, we have per, uh, been uh, portrayed. That's right. By you saying the shining star and you see me, the fact that I was heavily endorsed by the unions and they know that I'm unapologetic to make sure that when I'm on calls like this, that there's more people that look like me. So the, the narrative that I want to make sure that we change is when we talk about the unions, it has to be a different look. It has to be a either a public service announcement that I'm able to use my public relations background and partner with some of the um, African-American organizations so they know that unions are not just a Caucasian and female dominated type of organization. There's individuals that look like me that are in the unions and that they are opening and that you want to be involved in a part. But by saying all of that, I don't want them to think that when individuals of color are involved and want to be involved in a union, that I'm gonna give them a pass because the same part is that I'm very hard and, and tough because we're talking about individuals' lives. I cannot have an individual that's going to be involved in anything that's taught in a building and you have an F in, 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 in science, an F in math, or you, you did not pass and you skip. This this is not the type of, of organization or industry that we can be um, lightweight with. We're talking about people's lives when you're building and we can't have any deaths in the part that you um, got passed through being lack and, and, and inefficient in your, 
and the reading fundamental and math skill set. So that is our job to make sure from the zero five age that an individual has those type of literacies and has those type of skills that they need to go on. And um, also have a conversation with parents and caretakers that if your child wants to have an expansive um, career, that if they don't have to look at it as being a doctor or a lawyer, that they can look at all of this and look at there's maybe that might be the, be the profession for them that they that's why they need to be embracing this type of the unions and why it's going to be the best way to change the gap of not just saying poor class we can have all classes of individuals making a great decent amount of money to be a part of society and their family so thank you absolutely and thank you very much for that and that's the perfect lead-in for uh, our next speaker we're going to have uh Pamela Hacker uh, talked to us a little bit. Uh, she's a construction electrician uh, and uh, from Pennsylvania. So Pamela. Morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. I joined the IBEW in 1984 when women, it was not a woman's world, trust me. But it was something that I had tried college three times um, growing up it was everything was geared to going to college. And my father was a pipe fitter and I didn't, I didn't like college. It wasn't for me. And I found the IBEW through working as a secretary at the, uh, during the building and construction of the Limerick nuclear power plant. And that's how I met. That's how I found out about the trades. And I'm a jeans and a t-shirt kind of gal. And I thought I'm as big as them. I'm as strong as them. I know I'm smart. I just needed to find that niche that worked for me and construction worked. I, it's a different ball game. You have to be a different bear to, to survive in that world. Um, but I liked it. And I, I took my knocks. I earned my stripes. And 35 years later, I successfully retired with all bones intact. But I think one of the things that really I saw growing up was that it was all about going to college. And it was almost demeaning to be a tradesperson. And through the years, I, I saw that trend starting to shift. And I think we need to focus on that, that it's okay to work with your hands. It's okay to get dirty. It's okay to go to work in jeans and a t-shirt. It's all right. But one of the things I really took the most pride in was at the end of the day, when I built something and it was finished, um, I saw other people come in and it created jobs. And when we saw highways being built and the infrastructure and the jobs that opened up along that highway that we built, um, it, it's, it, it's the base. Every, every good organization has a great foundation and infrastructure is absolutely the foundation of our industry uh, for it to grow. And I'm very proud to be, you know, a, a woman in the trades. Um, I, I worked with many, many great men and women, but we do need more women. And I think I'd like to be a part of, you know, sharing my experiences, what's required. And the only thing they, they asked was that I showed up and I did my job. That was it. They didn't care. <laughs> they were the only two requirements. And so I'm happy to say my husband was a Mr. Mom for 14 years and I worked and it kind of switched the roles there, but it was, it was, <laughs> it worked, it worked for us. And I'm, I'm proud to say, you know, I, I'm thankful for everything that I earned and everything that the union provided me. And it was a great experience. And I'd love to see, I'd love to be a part of this and help this continue to grow because there is a real need for the baby boomers and, you know, the next generation that's, you know, aging out of this to be a part, to bring the youth in, to be a part. Thank you. Robert, I think you just got your PSA for what we talked about for um, the testimonials for how the unions work. We have a woman who told you how she came in her boost out, rode up, and did what it had to be done. So I appreciate you, Pam. You know, I think me and you're going to be BFFs. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> there you go. Thank you very much for that. Uh, uh, we're going to switch gears just a little bit, and then we're going to come back and talk because I got a couple questions that I want to ask you that kind of were in the chat. So uh, I'll, I'll give you a second here to, to catch your breath, and we're going to move on to Bill Layton. Uh, he's a business rep with the Elevator Constructors, and also 
with the apprenticeship program in Virginia. So Bill, the floor is yours. Thank you, good morning. Uh, Bill Layden, I'm business manager, Elevator Constructors Local 52 in Norfolk, Virginia. Um, I've got over 15 years as an apprentice instructor. I also work on uh, project development with the uh, apprenticeship program. I'm, I'm very proud of the things that I've done with them. And joining as an apprentice in 1986 uh, with the Elevator Constructors Union has certainly changed my life and I've seen it change so many others for the better. Uh, apprenticeship's not new though. Apprenticeship started in the Middle Ages to ensure men and women were trained and experienced in their craft. Uh, competition then, though it was from the next village, is similar to the competition that we have now from around the world. And the standards were established and maintained by guilds and mer merchant associations uh, to ensure the highest quality of products and services. Right? You had to promote that your trade, your craft, your house was the best if you wanted to do business. And the European model continued in America, mostly unchanged. Uh, George Washington was a, an apprentice surveyor. Uh, ben Franklin, my favorite guy, uh, was an apprentice uh, printer, right? And we, there were some dips, some, some highs and lows in that, but uh, we, we really got rolling when Wisconsin created the first state registered apprentice system in 1911. And in 1937, Congress enacted the National Apprenticeship Act, and it established the apprenticeship program uh, much as it is today. Uh, apprenticeship is regulated under the U.S. Department of Labor, uh, Employment and Training Administration, and is now in its 84th year. And I believe that registered apprenticeship is as essential now as at any time in our history or any time in the history of the world. Projects funded by the National Infrastructure Bank and, and the current um, infrastructure plan and any others that may come along, whether they're, they're local or state or uh, federal uh, initiatives, they're going to require skilled labor. And in spite of uh, all the, the layoffs and the hardships that we've experienced for the last year uh, due to COVID, prior to that, we were at record uh, employment levels and many in the construction trades haven't seen a reduction in work over the last year. Uh, if we need to find thousands or tens of thousands, millions of new workers, they're not just waiting at home for that phone call. These people have to be trained and they have to be uh, trained specifically to their skill. I think apprenticeships are a great idea at all levels. If, if you've got a little shop and you train your employees as apprentices and they learn your craft, that's a, that's a great thing. The problem is it's got limitations. Uh, registered apprenticeship is far superior because registered apprenticeship requires that your apprenticeship program meet measurable standards, that your apprentices achieve um, goals along the way toward their getting their, their journey certification or their, their master certification or whatever the conclusion of your program is. Um, frankly, though, the best are the, the union apprenticeship programs, and that's because of portability. I'm an elevator mechanic. I went through an apprentice program in 1986 to 1989, and I sat for a master exam, and I became a certified elevator mechanic. That program has evolved now. It's about four and a half or five years, depending on uh, where in the cycle you start. And no matter where you are in the country, if you're an elevator mechanic, if you're a pipe fitter, if you're a boiler maker, that credential is uniform across the country and recognized anywhere in the country. The license that the state of Virginia issued to me based on my elevator uh, apprentice credentials is uh, there's reciprocity across the, most of the country for that license. Based on that, we need to have uh, initially, I think the starting of a change in the attitude, I agree with everyone who spoke before me about that. It needs to start um, in the schools. Most of the, the teachers, well, frankly, everybody in a school except for the secretaries and the custodians has a college degree. So they promote college as the answer, that it's the, 
Um, it's the, the holy grail of education for everyone. And that's just frankly not true and, and sadly not accurate for so many who have spent a lot of time and a lot of money and they're left with just the debt because they realized it wasn't for them and they didn't conclude it. Um, colleges and universities don't train skilled workers. They train people in a great variety of things. But if we're building a bridge, say, we're going to need a few architects and engineers, and we're going to need uh, a couple of people with some business training, for sure, to manage the project, some people that are accountants to keep track of the finances of the project, and we're going to need hundreds of people, trades workers, to actually build the project. And those people, it, the, the scale of that means that we need to change the narrative when we're promoting what kids should be doing or, or seeking or looking into, uh, we need to change that narrative so that we have many more people that actually are skilled to do the work than people who are aspiring to lead the work, but so many tragically fall short. Um, community colleges and for-profit straight schools, I believe that um, they have their part in this as well. Uh, again, though, there's a limitation. They don't have on-the-job training. And Having a program where uh, we're working under the most ideal conditions, whether we're learning HVAC work and we're working inside a, a warehouse and there's great lighting and temperature controlled and everybody has clean clothes. And well, that's not the same as when you're answering the trouble call in the middle of the night and you've got to get the equipment running. And unless you experience that through the on the job part of apprentice training, you're never going to really appreciate the significance of it. Uh, if you could bring up the, uh, the first slide. All right, this slide represents a, a graph of where we've come and we've, we've made tremendous improvements uh, over the last 10 years. The word has gotten out that if you want a good job, if you want a career, if you want healthcare, right? Having good union jobs that begin with apprenticeship and end with certification, and then continuing education because the education in our field never really ends. Uh, we cure the healthcare problem because every good union paying job comes with a comprehensive healthcare plan. So we've grown 128% in the last 10 years. This is a report from uh, 2019. 705,000 new apprentices uh, since January 17th. 35% to 38% more. Uh, active apprentices than the previous 10 year average. The plan is working, the word is getting out there, we need to start spreading it to the children earlier. Uh, my dad told me, whatever you wanna do when you grow up, you gotta have a skill so that when you get laid off, you don't have to ask to be Santa Claus at Macy's to pay the bills. If we could bring up the next slide. Everyone should be aware of this and promote it. This is the government's website, apprenticeship.gov. Uh, this is a federal site that's been up for a couple of years now. There's links, you type in some trade that you might be interested in and the uh, zip code for where you are, whether you're willing to relocate, tremendous amount of resource here. And then we're behind the curve because arguably the most highly skilled and efficient workforce in the world, Germany, trains over 60% of their high school graduates in apprenticeship programs. They have a model that absolutely works because they believe that we should find out the skill set of a young person before we set them into the world and then give them the options that fit who they are, what their personality is. If there is someone who wants to work with their hands, they want to build things, they're going to suffer and die if you put them in an office. We too can achieve that if we begin to spread the word to all the schools, all the administrators, and all the guidance counselors that apprenticeship is a viable option for so many of our young people. And we absolutely need to begin training that workforce if we are going to rebuild the infrastructure of this country. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Bill, for that. Um, I, I will remind everyone who, who's in attendance of the webinar is uh, uh, the Q&A section is open. Uh, if you have questions, please 
uh, submit those questions so that we can make sure that uh, we try and get an answer for you uh, today in that. Uh, so uh, please take advantage of that. Uh, we're going to go around a little bit, and, and I'm going to ask a couple questions that were kind of earlier in the Q&A to, to see if I can get a couple of responses. So I'm going to ask uh, for <clears throat> Lou Spencer. Uh, one of the questions was, can you make a good living at being a tradesperson? And, and what types of, uh, uh, you know, benefits, salaries, et cetera, are we looking at? Because they're comparing college uh, and, and the potential there and what you have in the tradesperson. So, Lou, if you wouldn't mind ha handling that question, that'd be great. Sure. Um, I can use myself as an example. I was in uh, community college studying mechanical engineering and became restless and um, applied for the plumber's apprenticeship program, was accepted into the program. At the time, it was a four-year program. Now it's five. And uh, I graduated. I graduated as a journeyman plumber. And uh, eventually, I went back to college and got a degree in construction management. And between being a tradesperson and uh, a project manager, I worked in the field. I worked in the office. Um, I've had a great career. I have nine plumbing licenses and uh, was a construction executive. And I always kept my union card good, always was active in the union. And now I'm a, a local union uh, business agent. But um, I've raised a family and I look forward to a decent retirement. And um, it's a great life. It's rewarding. You go to work every day, you produce, and you can drive around town and show your family, friends, and relatives all the wonderful projects that you worked on. Uh, it's a great career. And if we get this infrastructure bank passed, um, there's going to be a whole lot of people working in the construction industry doing that very same thing, looking at the bridges, the dams, the roads, the rail, the broadband, all the projects that we're going to be doing. And that's something that people can take pride in. It's a great living, secure retirement, and a lot to show for. Thanks for that. Um, I, I, I too, uh, I, I'm, I, I am recently retired from, uh, uh, from, uh, the field to be able to do this, uh, uh, and, and it's a great feeling to be able to have that retirement, uh, that pension to be able to come in and be able to do that and still be able to uh, uh, enjoy that same uh, living standard. Uh, I'm going to switch a little bit and ask Pam. Uh, one of the things that uh, always continues to, to get questioned is uh, what's the difference in pay for <coughs> men and women in the trades? There is no difference. It's, that's, that's the end. And, and <laughs> <laughs> there is no difference, whatever level you're at. And, and, the, but getting back to the apprenticeship, that was, that was huge because when I started, um, when I got accepted in, if it wasn't the light bulb, I had no clue what was wrong. And it was, I remember my first mechanic saying, hand me channel locks. And I pulled it out of my tool bag, these, and he's like, <laughs> He's like, yes, Pam knows. And, but it was something that every day was a challenge. Every day was a new adventure. The people I worked with, the buildings I built and, you know, going from a nuclear power plant to a shoe store, it, the diversity within the job is, is tremendous. And in all the trades, we just don't do one thing. It, it's very diverse. And I, and I love that about the trades. And um, I, but you have to get used to a porta john, um, <laughs> you know, and sometimes they are cleaned every day. Um, they, there are different aspects. You pack your lunch every day. They laugh at me because I bring my lunch every day. But for 35 years, I did that. But I think the apprenticeship, um, it was great. I found that net, that correlation between what I was learning and what I was working at. And that is huge that I mm -hmm. didn't have in college um, and tried that three times. But the fact that I could go to school at nights and I went two nights a week, three hours a night, and then go in the next day and my foreman would say, what are you working on, you know, in school? And I would tell him and, and he's like, all right, here we go. And so I had the theory and now I had the actual practice of it. And the two together just it it it's so empowering to have to have that ability 
to actually be able to practice what you learned. And I think the apprenticeships are just crucial in providing that that college doesn't. And so that's why I'm pro trade. <laughs> For that, Pam. I, I'm going to ask uh, a question came up in here and and is asking, you know, what are some of the plans for high schools and, and early education? So I'm going to ask uh, both Lisa and Joe if they wouldn't mind giving a comment on what they kind of see and, and kind of some of the things they want to uh, implement uh, through legislation to be able to start to, to improve and, and what we can do as a group to be able to improve opportunities towards trade related uh, things there. So uh, <clears throat> Joe and uh, Lisa, if you wouldn't mind. Go ahead, sure, Joe. Bob. I'll, I'll chime in here. Is um, I you know I I look around my school districts. I, I have the pleasure of representing two school districts um, in my house district, and and in our schools that we currently have right now, we do have um, um, opportunities for kids to be able to um, to go into career readiness. It's what we call career readiness. You know, back in the day, I think um, it used to be called VoTech. And people would look down and go, oh, those kids at Votech, you know, they're the ones that are the misbehavior and kids in the classroom, they're the ones that's not directed to our college. But actually, that's exactly the opposite what's happening here in our school districts. But you, uh, but what we need, we, we, we have to build on and expand because there was a time when, you know, our school districts across the nation were shooting kids all the way to college, go to college, go to college. And that's probably because the trades were exaggerated at that time and there weren't, um, there weren't those jobs that were available. But now they, so we kind of took our pendulum one way and then we went a whole different way, but now we need to come middle ground. But um, so looking at one of our schools, is it, um, you know, operators, you know, you, you see all those big um, um, pieces of machinery, they're building the, the roads and things like that. Is it feasible that a school be able to put in a program that would teach you how to be able to drive uh, to drive that backhoe or what have you? Probably not. But there could be some collaborations that we have with our locals that do do that training, and um, you know, so there's opportunities there. And, and I, you know, I want to hit on something though too. I have a son that's in the trades. He's 23, and um, he's a new dad. Um, and he's a new husband, but what has been so rewarding for him is that he can be able to um, own that first home. You know, think about, you know, I, I, I didn't imagine at 23 that I would ever own my first home, but my son has been able to do that. Why? Because he is in the trades. He's making a good wage and he has good benefits um, so that he can be able to provide for his daughter and he can be able to take his daughter to, to the doctor and not have to worry about not having insurance. But he's also building up that resume for his um, retirement. And, um, and he actually is um, in the 180th out here. He's in the Air Force um, as, um, on the weekends. So he, he came in through that, uh, to the program for, for veterans within his trade. So there's so many wonderful opportunities. I'm also a recipient of the trades. My husband um, has worked for 30 plus years in the trade and it allowed me um, as we had two boys to be able to stay home um, and raise our two boys while he and be able at, to be actively involved in their, um, their young lives um, while my husband was earning a good wage for our family. So there's so many great, um, wonderful opportunities, but we have to really look at our, you know, look at our schools and have, I say it, that marketing plan um, to be in place to, to, to talk to our young kids about the opportunities that um, being in the trades will bring for them. And sometimes it's just not the adults in the room that need to have that conversation because I know that when I'm talking to to younger kids, they kind of look up to me as that older person. Well, yeah, you're you're older and you're wiser. You're supposed to tell us all these things. So it's really connecting um, those younger kids um, to have those conversations. So it's really putting that marketing in behind to um, be able to talk about 
how great it is to go into these trades. So I, I into these fields. So I kind of look at my 23 year old son that I was talking about earlier, him going into the schools and talking to the younger kids about what it's been able to provide for him um, as a 23 year old, where I think some of our kids wouldn't imagine it until probably in their thirties. But the other good thing is that um, you're getting paid while you're going to an apprenticeship program. You're earning the benefits while you're going to that apprenticeship program. You might be taking some classes in the evening as um, has been uh, the Pam brought up, but you're, you're putting the application into the day uh, in your day work, but you're not going in debt and paying off your college debt um, until you're in your late forties or fifties. Um, so those are just some of those um, pieces of parts that are uh, really good about this, but we, what we can do within our schools uh, to start growing them now. So they're working parallel. Thanks, Lisa. And Joe, do you have anything to add? Thank you. Right after Pam spoke, my computer went haywire, so she probably did something with the electric. <laughs> so I came over to her office. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we, you know, the things we can continue to do is promote the programs. And we saw when I got on the, um, the, the uh, trade school board, the, the CTC, we had about 400 kids in the program. When I left, we had close to eight or 900. Because we went through the districts and we showed that these are great paying jobs. They have a great future. The stigma, we took away everywhere we could, uh, took away the stigma. And then we saw kids graduating, we were automatically going in $75,000 jobs. One kid got a $100,000 job right out of the school and into programs where they were seeing sustainable incomes with no big debt. Lisa just spoke about the debt that, you know, her son, the career. My son graduates in three weeks with $100,000 worth of debt from the university. $100,000, he'll work in the insurance business and hopefully over 10 years we'll pay down that debt. But our students are getting out of the trade schools with no debt, going into apprentice programs with high paying jobs right away, with good sustaining life paying jobs like Pam talked about in her career, like Bill spoke about in the, you know, when, um, it was the other gentleman on here who just spoke about it, uh, the elevators. Um, Will you come out with great paying jobs? Although we can use you at the Capitol, by the way, if you want to come to uh, Harrisburg, we've had issues since I've gotten there um, with our elevators. But anyway, that's another story. Um, but, you know, we laugh about it, but our escalator has been down for almost three years back and forth. And I said, finally said the other day, how can we not find qualified people to be able to fix this thing the right way? And someone turned to me and said, they're non-union. Um, and that really was like, okay. Uh, so it shows the training that our students are getting, how they're coming out of these programs. Um, we just need to go back and say, there is no more stigma. You know, there is there's no reason why you can't work in the trades. Again, I had someone come to the home recently and I paid over $200 for an hour visit. And I didn't think he was there 20 minutes. Uh, but you can't find people who are trained in this anymore. And as parents, we had said to kids, oh, we don't want you to be like our parents were and you should go on and have an easier career. My father was a union member for his whole life. You know, got up, worked hard, had a pension. My mother used to call it the little pension that she had for the rest of the life after he passed away, which helped her pay the rent. Uh, so these are things that we need to continue to push and we need to take this away on the educational side. Now, one thing I will say, though, if we can do this, I am a very big advocate of comprehensive high schools and making the high school where the kid walks down the hallway and takes the classes in the other part of the building and no one even knows it. So there is no stigma whatsoever. So they're still on the football team and the band, you know, in the arts programs, whatever it is, they can continue down that path. Um, it is a much more expensive educational option, but I think one that takes away, oh, I have to go off to that other school. In New York, it used to be part of the BOCES system where I grew up, um, it used to be called Wilson Tech and they would say, oh, the kids going over the BOCES system. Take all that away. Just make it one part of a high school education. Let's build it all back into our high schools to make it a lot easier. So I hope that answers the question. Thanks, Joe, for that. Uh, somebody else who just joined us, uh, Erica White uh, from CWA uh, uh, president, uh, to talk a little bit about broadband and the apprenticeship program. So one of the questions that was on here was, uh, what uh, other than the building trades, what other types of uh, apprenticeship programs are out there? And I know CWA has one to be able to do that. So Erica, if you wouldn't mind, you're on. 
Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Sorry, I had a few difficulties getting in today, but I'm excited to be here. I had to call him from my phone. But right, so when we talk more about um, the trades, the trades are, are really a wide, diverse, we can't think of that as being a monolith. Um, we talk about people or the jobs available. So what I'm going to talk about is broadband, and I love what Representative Parker said, and also um, Representative Sebecki, that adding on to that, that for people, and this might sound funny, but I am actually an outside plant engineer, and I'm not that great at math. So what does that mean when we're talking about that? It means that what if we actually started with training kids in school, young people in school, what they, what they want to be geared toward and to pass those tests? So most of the tests we take for to get into the trades or to work at, um, like I do for AT&T or Verizon, the way we do that is we begin by having to take a test, correct? And that's something we've taught all the way through school. That is one of the bases that I always um, promote when we're talking about how do we get kids interested and in moving toward getting into skilled trades. And in broadband, I don't know if any of you know that you cannot get a degree in telephony engineering. It does not exist. And even if someone came in with an engineering degree, they would still have to learn how that works with telephony. How does fiber connect? How are we talking about copper works? What are... Um, Boost, I'm not, not boosters, I'm sorry. Um, now it's skipping my mind, but how we boost the signal and capacitance and all those things, how it actually affects when we're talking about broadband and, and taking voice across copper. So teaching people the test, I'm not to move, um, teaching people the test, of course, where I parked that, someone's cutting grass now, go figure. But um, teaching kids the test and way we build confidence in getting those jobs is teaching young people how to pass the test. So from there, instead of starting where I did, I had a test in an entry level and I started as an information operator. As an information operator, I was at the entry level at the lowest band. And we also had those who were considered to be communication technicians in which they set up just the basic phone service. Now we've developed into broadband, which means those jobs are highly technical. They're very skilled. What if we can train and help children or kids or even adults who are trying to make a better living, move socially and mobily? Um, we're talking about up and making better pay. So we're talking about young people, but let's just talk about Americans, people who are not or disadvantaged or not able to be able to take part into testing for these jobs. What if we can make it where they can test the jobs? Can you turn around the other way? Um, what if we can make that where they can test those jobs, where we make that a reality, or I would just say, and I would say a reality, but making them confident that they can do that. And it begins by teaching people and they don't have to start then as I did, as an information operator, they can test in the jobs that we're seeing where they pay 80 to 90,000 to $100,000 a year. And with broadband, and understanding broadband, we can start that in high school. And when young people are graduating, they're making 75,000 base a year and they're in a union and they're having pensions and healthcare and things are important. But just to expand that training beyond just high schools, we have to go back and capture people that have been cut out or disenfranchised through education and through opportunities. So we want to keep that in mind. So with broadband, what does that training look like? is making sure people understand what it is to connect fiber, what is fiber connectivity? How do we send signal across? Most of us know we just plug it in and when it doesn't work, it kind of makes us mad, right? So how do we teach that? How do we teach simple skills and teach those math skills that are specific to a job? So I can tell you when we're talking about math, why I didn't like math is because the math that they were teaching me wasn't math that I found very practical to what I did every day in life. But what if we really start focusing on math and education that has to do with the jobs of the future that people can actually test and acquire. That makes a big difference and it, it motivates learning. So what does that training look like? Those Again, we have to remember that this training takes years. That's why it's called skilled labor. It's skilled because you just can't walk in off the street and say, I've got this. And it takes the same amount of time to become a skilled laborist as it does to go to college. It's the same thing. The difference is nothing but the pay <laughs> and how quickly you can get there. So let's remember that. Let's remember to train our young people and those people that have been disenfranchised to access jobs, how to pass the test, teach them math that actually has to do with skills to the job that they're really qualified for. And when we talk about broadband, there is such a huge deficit in broadband disparities. You're talking about 
creating technology, keeping up with technology and moving on with technologies. When we talk about broadband, this is a job that's in a skilled trade that can continue to feed families and keep families sustainable wages for decades. So I'm excited about that. And I hope we really start to rethink how we connect people to jobs and how we educate people to do the best and keep them confident in their skills and social mobility. Thank you. Thanks for that, Erica. Uh, the, the one thing we have to keep in mind here is this is part of, of what we're trying to do here. This is the National Infrastructure Bank. The, the bill we're trying to get passed is to make sure that the financing is in place for the infrastructure needs of this country. And what we're trying to address right now are how, how do, after we get these 25 million jobs, how do we how do we get those people trained to be able to do that? And these are the apprenticeship programs and this is a community college. These are steps to be able to start to do that. It's, it's changing minds again to be able to, to, to start to think differently than what we've done. Um, much like the National Infrastructure Bank's a different way of thinking. We're going back in history. It's been done four times before and every time it's been done, it's been needed. And the National Infrastructure Bank has been very important uh, to be able to make sure that we were able to build all that infrastructure that was necessary. Hoover Dam, things like that, big projects. And that's the type of, uh, of thinking that we need to have right now. Uh, appropriations, where we continue to say we're going to pay for it strictly through the, the appropriations process, is not enough. It's one link. The National Infrastructure Bank is the other part. But also in lockstep, and I commend uh, uh, both uh, Representative Lisa Sebecki and, and Rep. Joe Cerisi for bringing this uh, forward a little bit to make sure that we focus on the apprenticeship and the needs of that type of, of work that needs to be done. Uh, and, and with that, it, it's important to, that we continue to talk to people about how it is. All people are different. They, uh, they're all motivated by different things. I mean, uh, uh, going back to what Bill Layton said about how he was able to go around and show that uh, projects he worked on to be able to say that, and, and what Lou said, where they went around to be able to say, hey, I built that project. I can remember when I was a dad, we have uh, Davis Bessie, the nuclear power plant out here. My kids called it the cloud factory because guess what? When it's online, it makes clouds every day. And when dad worked at the cloud factory, it was like a cool thing to be able to say, hey, dad works at the cloud factory to be able to do that. Those are, those are things that really can bring great satisfaction to an awful lot of people. And, and we have to encourage them to do it. I did the college thing. I, I, I wound up going into the trades. And I'll tell you what, the reason I wound up going into the trades at the end of the day, I like to see that uh, a project completed, something that was accomplished to be able to do that. And there are an awful lot of people in this country who are motivated by that type of thing. And so we have to make sure that we reach out to these kids and we reach out to these people, uh, young people, female, African-American, all minorities, et cetera, they're all welcome to be able to get in this trade and we need them to be able to do it. And we have to start to be able to, to make that happen. It, it's not always easy to be able to have those conversations, but I will tell you, there's, there's that type of uh, uh, possibilities there. Uh, with that- hey Robert? Go ahead. One, one question, and I, I've been hearing the, the common theme has been apprenticeship. So can everyone um, address when you're talking about the apprenticeship, could you please, because I'm looking at my phone, I don't want to make the link, I got to make sure I have it right. Please discuss when is the appre apprenticeship application, because we're saying apprenticeship, but there's always a certain window when individuals need to apply for the apprenticeship. Um, and then people can't come to me in like December to talk about apprenticeship when the window has passed. So each um, union and trade has a different um, window for their apprenticeship. Can we make sure everyone knows when that window is? And so we can do a better job making sure our constituents and everyone knows when they need to apply. Thanks. Uh, uh, Bill, do you have, uh, I, I mean, I, I know how our union has started. To do, we've started to take applications year round to be able to do it so that we have actually started to move into that thing. And I know other unions are moving towards that model. Um, Bill, is there anything that uh, you might be able to add to that? Yes, sure. Uh, depending on uh, projected uh, demand for additional workforce is, is certainly a factor. Uh, locally, we create a hiring list every two years. Um, announcements are sent out through social media, through old fashioned newspaper media for whatever that's worth. Um, and we have a, a period where you would go for uh, 
to our website to fill out the, the, elect, the application electronically. Um, typically our enrollment is open for about a month. And then after it's closed out, um, as long as you meet the, the basic criteria and that's essentially that you're 18 and you have a high school diploma or equivalent, uh, you're then scheduled in our case for a, a series of tests. Uh, there's a mechanical aptitude test, a reading comprehension test, uh, a tool assessment test, and a um, arithmetic test. Assuming that you, you pass all of those, uh, then you're brought in and there's an interview process where uh, a representative from the union and a representative from um, management representing the various employers uh, team up and we go through an interview uh, based on your work history, your education, your test scores, uh, and so military, uh, prior military service gives you a little bump. I think that's appropriate. Uh, based on that, you're, you're ranked on a hiring list. And then when one of the employers calls the hall looking for um, a half dozen apprentices to start a new project, uh, the, the business rep would start with that list with the highest ranked individual, contact them, tell them what the opportunity is. They're either available or they're not available. And you continue that list until you uh, find people who are agreeable to, uh, to start and meet the uh, conditions. And once they are hired on at one of the employers, uh, their education process begins immediately. Uh, they're enrolled in our apprenticeship program. And for the first six months, while they're in their probationary period, uh, in addition to the on-the-job training, they're receiving a, a home study course in, in basic safety and some history of the, uh, the, the trade and, and our apprenticeship. Um, following the, the completion of their, their probationary home study course, uh, the following September or January, because we have semesters, not full years, uh, they're enrolled in the night school with the rest of the apprentices. Uh, so other trades um, that have a, a higher demand, ours is a more, I don't want to say exclusive group, but we have a smaller uh, number of trades people because our work is so specialized. Uh, other trades would have more frequent um, enrollment periods than we do. And again, it would be to satisfy um, anticipated demand. Well, I, I, you bring up some great points. Uh, the thing that uh, I think drives the apprenticeship at the end of the day, how many people come in is, is the scope of what the, our outlay of what work is going to be coming here. And, and what we see with the National Infrastructure Bank is a huge opportunity for a large investment in the infrastructure needs in this country. And as, as that starts to go, there will be uh, basically a multiplier effect that will that will go. Manufacturers will start to be able to get their products to, to market, to be able to do that. And so they need that infrastructure to be able to get things, high-speed rail, uh, all those types of things, all have different uh, apprenticeship programs to be able to get involved, to be able to do all that. So what, what we feel and what I feel at the end of the day is important is that if you, get the, if you start to say the jobs are coming and the, the work's coming, guess what? Uh, there's going to be more of a push to be able to have more people in the apprenticeship programs to do it. And I agree with you, uh, <clears throat> Darisha, at the end of the day, one of the things we have to make sure uh, we do a better job of it and unions have to start uh, doing that is as we reach out to be able to do it, we have to become better community partners to be able to make this happen so that we get kids that uh, are out there who really uh, are looking for that opportunity to be able to do that. And we have to figure out how to be able to work a lot better to make that happen. So without a doubt. Um, so I, I want to add on Go there ahead. a little bit though too, is that, and I, it was said, Pam said this earlier on, but I want to go back to it though, is uh, we talk about um, pay um, inequality um, in so many areas um, and the job markets out there. But I, I really want to hit this hard because uh, the skilled trades area um, does not have pay inequality. <laughs> a woman gets paid what a male gets paid. And also is that um, it's not just a male dominated field. We just saw Pam is, is given us, um, you know, her, her, um, her, um, her background of what she had done and where she had retired from, from being an electrician. But um, and so 
we really need to focus though too is that th this is not just a male dominated field anymore. It's for women, it's for minorities, it's for pay. It, you wanna talk about someone that shows um, pay quality <laughs> and not pay inequality is a union, is the union jobs because I've never ever seen any person that's ever gone out there and negotiated contracts and said, the males get this and the females get this. It is not, that does not happen. So, and I think there's some myths out there. So I'm um, continuing to um, talk and um, reach out to our young ladies as well. Um, even if we're starting at the school level or we're going at the adult level, that these are good paying jobs for, for everyone. It's not select. So I just want to, you know, kind of hit that home a little bit harder. Thank you. Thanks for that. Uh, well, uh, we're going to, uh, and, unless there's somebody else who's a, a participant that, that wants to dive in on, on something that we might not have hit real quick. Uh, uh, we're going I'd like to go ahead, go for it. Just add a, a, a little bit about the question about um, wages. Uh, my niece is a brilliant um, mechanical engineer. Uh, she graduated from Penn State and then completed her sixth year uh, with a specialty in robotics. She has a master of engineering. Uh, Lockheed Martin hired her straight out of school. They paid her internships while she was in school um, at 90,000. Pretty good. But she spent six years busting her butt in college in one of the most difficult uh, courses of study there is. My apprentices, when they graduate my program, will make more than that. And our, um, our wage for a graduating mechanic is 145% of the median income in Virginia. Uh, anybody who's interested, I would pronote NEEP, N-E-I-E-P dot org. Any place in the country that we are hiring, you can find the information on that is our education site. Thanks a lot for that. Um, <clears throat> Erica, do you have anything else you'd like to add to this? Uh, being... Uh, from the CWA perspective? I know Eric. There we are. There you go. Okay. So, is an add on that, um, I know with the University of Toledo, which may shock people, that a lot of the universities that employ um, people, we actually have apprenticeship programs. So, um, oh, the representative is asking, do we have it's a little different because we're not set up the same as? as the um, trades. So a lot of what we have is contractually in our contracts. So people do have to get, that's why I talked a little bit about more about passing tests and getting in. Once we have people in there, then we're able to put them in apprenticeship program to be air quality technicians. That's something people don't think about. What is an air quality technician? Well, if you're working in a building, you have to make that sure the air quality is up to up to par so that people what can breathe without getting sick there. Correct. But especially we've seen that with COVID and trying to get things up. Those people, um, there's an air quality one, an air quality two, an air quality three that which we negotiated in which we offer an apprenticeship. So if you get hired in at the basic level, we help you move up. So a little dif differences with CWA is many of our jobs you do have to test in. You have to get the, started there and then we can move you to an apprenticeship program. But it's very important as, and I know Representative Sebecki and Representative Cerisi talked about that, that there is a huge trade, huge change and shift to what jobs look like that are actually skilled trades and those apprenticeship programs. So I really wanna encourage you and um, I missed who was saying that earlier about their niece starting a program um, and getting her uh, mechanical engineering. I'll just say that bargain for depending where you live in the country and a um, outside plant engineer makes about 90,000 plus a year, um, depending where you live. Um, so we're talking about, yeah, it, but it takes five years to get there, but think if it takes you five years to get there, what that starting wage is. And then we're not talking, we're including overtime, pension, benefits, all those things. And just to share that, um, we know that people are moving from jobs such as that and trying to get into public sector now to be firefighters and, and to, to get into trades because of something bigger than just the wage. We're talking pensions, healthcare, and having a voice and a place to speak up for safety and, and health concerns. And that happens when we pass the National Infrastructure Bank 
and we make sure that the jobs are connecting communities and people to those opportunities. So it's very important. I'm excited about that, but just want us to push outside. And then like there's women, minorities, we're looking for people and you don't have to be in high school to take advantage of these opportunities. They exist right now. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you for that, Erica. Uh, we're going to start to bring this to a close and, and there's a few things. Remember that the reason that we're on this call is it's about National Infrastructure Bank, trying to make sure that that policy gets adopted. Because if we can make sure that the financing is in place to, to build America, rebuild it, to be able to, to dream big and think big and be able to invest in ourselves again, it's going to take the National Infrastructure Bank uh, to be able to finance uh, what needs to be done. As Alfeca pointed out so uh, pointedly at the very beginning, even with uh, Joe, President Joe Biden's uh, uh, proposal to be able to do it, there's still going to be a shortfall in, in bringing our infrastructure needs up to, to, to par and then to be able to actually dream big and be able to make the big advancements that we wanna do. And making sure that we have the people who are building uh, to be able to do that, to be able to workers to get the workforce. It, it's all kind of uh, built, they're building blocks and foundational to be able to make sure that we wind up doing that. Uh, with that being said, we have a, a, a great group of, of people who have supported this and, and, and been able to work with this. And, and, and there's a real opportunity out there uh, for people uh, to be able to, uh, if they are involved in a group and, and can get that group uh, uh, their support. We are looking for that kind of support uh, from anyone that you might have a connection with to be able to do it. If you, if you need to uh, have a presentation done, please reach out to the NIB coalition and we will make sure that uh, we can get uh, somebody on a phone call or a Zoom call to be able to ha have this discussion to get those answers that they specifically need. In addition, right now we have an open letter to Congress that uh, we have uh, currently going out in that open letter to Congress. Um, there's an opportunity, it, it, you can sign, anybody can sign the letter, but we are looking for as many people as possible to sign this open letter to Congress about why this National Infrastructure Bank needs to be part of the conversation. If you wanna build back better, what you need to do is you need to have that plan, not just so it's short-term, but so it's long-term to be able to do it. Uh, there, there are so many people who have actually signed on to this letter. Right now, we have over 70 signers uh, with titles, et cetera. If you have a title to be able to do it, but even if you don't have a title, if you're just a concerned citizen, we want your name on this letter because it's important. And so we encourage you to do that. And finally, there's opportunities in every state to be able to make sure that resolutions are passed, much like uh, what Representative Cerisi and, and uh, Lisa Sebecki are doing in, in Ohio and Pennsylvania to be able to make sure those get passed. Uh, there are a number of states who have already had it passed and are moving forward. Uh, it's important that uh, we see, we basically, at the end of the day, we have to build the parade so the politicians will run to the front and take leadership and help it get across the line. And that's what we need uh, everybody on this phone call, if you get it, or on this webinar, I should say, to be able to go out and contact uh, their, their local representatives and, and get them interested in what this is. Because conversation at the end of the day is what we really need to have to be able to bring this all together. And, and finally, uh, one of the things that I will say is that uh, we have a YouTube channel and the YouTube channel actually goes and, and has the webinars that we have been doing since last August and has a whole bunch of uh, uh, a really dynamic and important information that discusses uh, specifics. This one here was about apprenticeships and jobs, but we've also talked about the history of the bill and, and, and the history of the bank to be able to do that. And it's important that we get that information out there. And, and it's already done. You can sit there, you can watch it and, and be able to do it. And if you need specifics, please visit our website. It's uh, www.nibcoalition.com. On there, you'll find a quick summary of what the bill is. You'll find out that frequently asked questions so that, so that you can kind of educate yourself to be able to understand uh, what's going on. But at the same time, uh, basically have the information you need to be able to share with them. So there, uh, we have, uh, 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 you can send an email request again to info at nibcoalition.com if you, if you uh, need a request uh, to have some people talk uh, 
uh, or to, to set up some kind of a conversation, that'd be great. And uh, we also have a Facebook page. So with that being said, I want to thank everyone for who was on the panel. Uh, you did a terrific job. It was a great discussion. Really, uh, I appreciate uh, everyone who's taken the time to get on here and share uh, their thoughts and, and that with it. And I especially I want to thank everybody who actually attended the webinar to be able to, uh, uh, th I thank you for your interest in this. This is something that if we're going to do, we have to be able to not only dream big, but if you want to dream and make it a reality, you have to get involved. And that's what we uh, know all of you are trying to do. And we really appreciate all that you do. So with that, I'm going to say goodbye and thank you to everyone and have a wonderful weekend. Bye now. Great weekend. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Take care.